first of all, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Another day, another week has gone by <laughs> of our live sessions <laughs> with, uh, with Rebels and Rulers, as a lot of you hopefully already know. Um, you know, we decided to do these live sessions so that you guys could get a little bit closer to the speakers that we've come to know and love over the past uh, couple of years. And since we couldn't all be in the same place, which we're heavily considering for next year, by the way, in case you want, want to look forward to some kind of reunion, um, uh, in lieu of having a physical event this year, we decided to do something online. So um, as you guys might know, we have a new masterclass, a new video for 24 hours each day. And then whenever we can, um, the following day, except on the weekends, the following days, in one of the following days from that video, we, we have a live session with the speaker, or in this case, two. So um, yeah, thank you for being here once again. Um, and thank you to you guys. I'm gonna introduce you guys just very quickly because I think people, people probably know who you are by now. But um, today we're continuing our live series with uh, two really great folks that actually at Rebels and Rulers spoke, uh, spoke heavily on nation branding. Um, but Miriam, who you might know from, from McCann, but she now works at Triller, which you should really look up if you're into TikTok, by the way, and if you love music. So definitely, definitely take a look. Um, and, and Guido, who is a lecturer at London School of Economics, and to be honest, is probably the best <laughs> nation branding expert that we know. So we're incredibly fortunate to, to have yeah. you guys here. Thank you very much for joining. Yeah, it seems like these soda cans are always are, are ever present. Um, <laughs> so thank you guys for being here. Welcome. Um, now for those of you that are watching so as always i have my questions we kind of uh we definitely have a lot to talk about but if you do have questions please don't keep them until the end definitely write them in the q a function on zoom or in the chat on facebook and i'll bring them in uh as often as i can and whenever whenever and wherever it makes sense but just uh don't hesitate um, but without further ado, I think I'm going to get started. So you guys, um, let, let me just recap maybe for some folks who, who, who didn't necessarily see the presentation. So Miriam, you talked a lot about storytelling and how the way storytelling is done and, and kind of the ethics around storytelling relates to country branding, which was, which was great because obviously for, for an event like ours and where it was located, it's incredibly important for us to learn how to maybe promote where we're from a little bit better. Um, and we'll go more into that. But the reason why I found that fantastic is because you kind of presented, let's say, the more, um, I don't want to say a higher level, but it's, but it's true to a certain extent, the higher level of why you should take this topic seriously. While I think, Guido, your, your, your seminar was, uh, was really on the practical side of how you actually execute on that nation brand. So I'm hoping that today, collectively, we can talk not only about nation branding necessarily, but try to you know bring those two sides together yet again um, and just discover a little bit more around the topic and especially given what has happened this year which is definitely something that we can't avoid in this conversation so something to look forward to um, but let's but let's just uh, let's just lay lay the foundation a bit so that we know exactly how you guys look at this topic from 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 the get-go and so I'm going to ask um, maybe Miriam you want to start but I'm going to ask how you believe the definition of brand which we consistently say has been uh, has remained undefined, has uh, been a little bit uh, all over the place. How do you think it's evolved maybe over over recent years? Um, well, so for, I, I actually really liked Hudo's definition of brand when I watched his session, which was, I thought, really simple and nice. And it was like, a brand equals a promise made and kept, right? And so I thought there was something, thank you, I did my homework. Um, I thought there was something really nice about that and I when I looked at your question I'm like has the definition of if, has the definition actually like evolved or is it just not you know is the promise not being kept on many fronts right now and is yeah. because of the promise made and I talked a little bit about this in my talk I feel that's the disconnect that's becoming more pronounced that's becoming the bigger gap that you're starting to see and then it's you know as a result it's throwing certain brands like in crisis I guess um, Guido? Yeah, I, I think, especially for nation branding, I think for a long time it was super superficial, 
right? Um, we talked about the definition of a brand to promise made and kept. And the part made is about communicating, saying it. And often uh, these brands are communicated through um, a nice logo and they make a big fuss about it. Um, and uh, But the thing is with a logo, people don't really remember it and not even from their own country often. So, you know, it doesn't really stick. Um, and then often you have a CNN commercial that, you know, runs for, uh, for a few, few months or a few weeks even, depending on how much money you have. And it's like, uh, uh, come to this country, all of this. It's so broad that you also forget what it's about because they haven't uh, made the promise very clear, what they are about, what they really want to communicate, right? So I, I think what, what countries are still learning a little bit is defining and, and daring to make a choice what they are about. Mm -hmm. Right, it's like a first date. Yeah. Right, it's a you don't tell everything in the elevator straight away. Like, hey, I do salsa. Hey, I do that. Hey, I do that. It's too much, right? You gotta cool down, person. But you know, same thing goes for branding, right? With with a country, you also have to make a choice of what you're gonna put forward on the first date, and what you're gonna put forward on the second date, and you know. But that's Miriam's, uh, you know, yeah. thing of storytelling. Yeah, and I think I think what. Guido's like saying in a way, and I agree with this a ton, is it used to be just like an empty vessel, right? Like a nation brand, here's a logo. It's a, here's, you know, the Netherlands. Here's, you know, what does that mean actually? And so now kind of actually imbuing that, filling that with something a little bit that has meaning in it um, has become more important for countries now than I think it has been in the past. And, that, and that's maybe changed is that you can't just have it functioning as an empty vessel anymore. So is that is that what we would say the similarity is then between a nation a nation's brand and that maybe of a person like a personal brand are there other things that are similar between humans and the way you would think about a country are there you know how is it different I think it's I think it's really nice sometimes to lay this in parallel because people tend to understand a little bit better how people function so if we can extrapolate a bit or even draw some lines then it might it might help solidify the point a bit I don't yeah. know what you guys think about that. Yeah, but you know, was just saying it, right? You meet me in an elevator and I'm like, I'm amazing. I speak seven languages. I salsa. <laughs> I do. Like, I'm either telling you like way too much and then I can't do any of those things or, you know, like I'm not saying anything at all. And I'm wondering why you as a person are not interested in me. Well, I haven't really communicated anything like that you're connecting to or sort of worth saying. So I guess that's my like human analogy, I guess, you know, I don't know what you think. No, absolutely. And then basically what you're wearing, right, is your visual identity or your logo, so to say. It says something about you, uh, but not everything. And then maybe I, I'll Google you afterwards on LinkedIn, right? And I see like, okay, what has she done? And then I see like, oh, she, she studied there. She worked there at McCann. Wow, that's pretty cool, right? And now she's doing here, she's being this big director at the company. I kind of go, like, oh, you know, you start connecting the dots and through connecting the dots, through connecting your actions, you start seeing what you are about as well, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a little bit the authenticity that both a, a person needs to be built up. And also, you know, on your LinkedIn, you're also very focused on what kind of image you want to portray about yourself, right? Because normally it is focused on attracting a certain kind of job or certain kind of clients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's what an, with a nation brand, you can have that too, right? You can have your LinkedIn, right? This is where you're interacting investors. You can have your, your Facebook account, right? You attract tourists. Right? So different channels, different ways and angles that you show off yourself to different audiences. Um, but for each audience, you need to define again, who do you want to be? And how do I, you know, communicate that? But also, is there some authenticity? Am I doing the stuff that I'm saying, right? And that all needs to connect together. Hmm. So then I think it's a lot about, I think it's a lot about setting the right expectations, but how do you do that on a global level? How do you take the expectations that you want to set as a country and, you know, speak to the world saying, come and visit me? I mean, there's gotta be, it's a little, little difficult, no? Well, I think like, right, I think this is kind of a funny thing, but like br brands of the country, right, become also like brand ambassadors sort of to the world. So like in the case of Romania, you guys have like, I, and I spoke about this last year, like ROM, 
where I would never, if I have all these sort of outdated media sort of things about what Romania is, which of which I did because I, you know, grew up in the U.S. where everything is sort of very one dimensional. It's Romania, Transylvania. And now I'm seeing some of the best creative like I've ever seen in my life coming from this country, from this like Romanian candy bar. And so like for me, that was a way for me. It kind of was provocative in a way for me to be like, well, what is, you know, what is there to Romania? How can I learn more about it? It starts to give like the country dimension. And again, it starts storytelling like a little bit on the brand's behalf, like I would say. Um, and so I do think like, you know, brands, it's, it's less about expectations and probably more about values, but how do you sort of bring those values then to the world in a way that all sort of humans can, can connect with it? Hmm. That's really nice what you're saying there because we often forget, right, that you can uh, communicate on different levels, right? And we know that a little bit from just product branding, right? You can communicate at the level of price, like, hey, come over here to this country because we have such a cheap flight or because, you know, uh, cheap drink. The beer is cheap. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, right? And um, then you have the level where you have functional benefits. There are certain things that you can do there or certain things you have. Okay. I have a little bit of a delay in there. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. Uh, my, Go ahead. My internet. <laughs> uh, then you have the functional benefits, right? Like, uh, um, for example, Amsterdam uh, as on one side, you know, the famous red light district, but also on the functional side, you have the museums, right? And that's what Amsterdam actually wants to be portrayed about because you kind of want to attract the museum people because they have more money to stay longer and stay in more expensive hotels. Right, but then you also go a little bit higher to values. What kind of people do you want to attract? Aker talks about self-expressive benefits, right? What does it say about you when you go to Amsterdam? I know what it says about you when, you know, if I said to you like, hey, Miriam and I were planning a weekend to uh, Paris, then you're going to go like, oh, you know? <laughs> if I would say Miriam and I are planning a weekend to Las Vegas, you're going to go like, oh, that's a whole different idea, right? If you say... <laughs> And Miriam and I are planning a weekend to Amsterdam, then you're gonna go to go. That's what you're gonna do, right? If I say Miriam and I are planning a, a weekend to Bucharest, then what kind of image do you have there, right? Hmm. So that's not there yet. But you could start communicating at that level of self-expressive benefits. I'm using your Miriam as uh, you know, a little victim in my story, but you, you start getting the point <laughs> a little bit more, right? Quite the victim. No. <laughs> It is Friday afternoon. I'm so it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, so, no, go ahead. <laughs> no, like, I, I think that's, and that's where I think my point is like the storytelling. Like, who are, there are so many ways to get like your story out into the world. The reason that we have these associations with France is because what do we watch? We watch tons of movies about France and it's romantic and the city of light. You've got like luxury brands, very romantic, kind of always romanticizing. French and like savoir faire. And so they're, you know, I think that's where I mean some of the brands become like ambassadors because they're kind of telling stories on behalf of the nation to some of, to, to the masses. Um, and in order to make some of those connections or have even any connections to make, there's got to sort of be an imprint of the mind goes back to the stories. What have I heard? What do I know? To start driving some of those associations like with the place. Hmm. So then, <clears throat> so then what kind of how, how do you how do you put that in place though? And <laughs> we know I'm looking at you, but like, how do you put that in place? You know, I, and and I think it's it's one thing. One of the questions is who is responsible for starting all of that, and is it just a matter of you know I don't know. We always associate it with a tourism board, but is that really what it is? And if so, once you've established something like that, you know, a national brand, what you want, the values to be, et cetera, et cetera, how do you get an entire country? and the brands and the ambassadors that are in there to fight for the same, you know, to deliver on that promise at the end of the day, because a nation's brand is, is solidified by every single person you meet from that country. So it, you know, it runs I deep. I didn't say it wasn't easy, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely not easy, right? Because with a, a corporate brand, you know, it's so easy, right? Because you have your brand and you have this whole environment that to a large extent you can control, right? And, and if it doesn't work, you can just, you know, go like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take it out of the market. But it's very hard to take your nation out of the market, right? Hmm. And also like your nation has a certain history al already and a certain authenticity. So you, you cannot like start all over fresh because you, 
you have very much like a history that you're already built and certain associations that are already there. Hmm. So it is a little bit more steering it into a certain direction of, or putting a spotlight on certain things. Um, that is one. And then actually doing it is often, yeah, often led by the tourism uh, authority uh, because, you know, getting in tourists is often first priority. A tourist is also a potential investor, you know, or a potential entrepreneur that wants to come to your country, potential talent. Right? Now, after visiting Bucharest, I kind of go like, okay, I could live here, right? But that was because I visited as a tourist. And, you know, uh, you can also do the other way around and try to attract me as, as a talent to come over. But that's a different kind of vibe, right? And now I kind of go like, I could see myself live here. So now I could work there as well. But besides the tourism agency, it's a lot about collaboration, right? So it's, uh, I always say nation branding is, is first and foremost about coordination and collaboration, right? So coordination, we all kind of need to have uh, the same mindset to say like, okay, this is what we kind of like want to portray, that's storytelling, mm. right? What are we about? How do we tell that? And then we all kind of need to jump on the same train so that we keep telling that same story um, through the tourism authority, through the taxi drivers even, you know, that, that tell you and show you the sites. You could do, uh, you know. Um, so you have all of these touch points, as we call it, these moments of interaction that you have uh, before you arrive and when you arrive that all should kind of like tell the same story. And so that when you're home, you can tell that story again to your friends. And that's when the brand starts hopefully working for itself, right? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think I definitely agree with like, you know, you can't just take it off the world stage, right? Like you, I think one thing that we've all learned this year is that none of us are in control of anything. So even when you're in a brand, when you, even when you're a brand, you're not in control. So as a country brand, you're definitely, you're not in control. You never should have thought you were in control because life could sort of change at, at any moment for you. <laughs> um, I mean, let's, and, and let's talk about this like practically. I mean, the US just went through quite a year, right? As, and think about this, like as a brand, even, you know, President Trump made a lot of people um, uncomfortable in some of like the things that he said, I can't take that, my brand off the market. I can't put, the, you know, the curtains around it. It is what it is. You kind of have to, you know, let what happens unfold publicly and then fix whatever you have to do later or not. If things were good and you liked what was done, depends where you think politically. Um, but I think that's a great example of like, you, you don't have control over it or what happens to it. And we spent years building up this brand sort of in the international world and have sort of spent the last four years like looking a lot more inward. It's quite, you know, it's quite a shift in the brand strategy, I would say. Mm. Okay. I'm wondering, I'm wondering what this means for, for countries that maybe feel like they don't have a proper brand on a large scale. You know, the U.S. is an example of, of, of someone that everybody knows. But what about, you know, the smaller ones that really, I don't know, they might just be appropriating brand, the brand of a region rather than the actual country while they're so significantly different than the ones next to them. What, what happens there? What happens when that doesn't exist? You know, I was in a, I was in an interview once here for, I'm using Romania as an example because I know it, but I was in an interview here where they literally asked me, you know, what, we don't have a, we don't have a, we don't have a, like a, an official, there's no official brand that everybody is behind. If you ask people if there is one, they would say, they would say no. And they would start to enumerate these different situations that they've been in where they've kind of noticed how people think about them because they are from Romania, but there's nothing, there's nothing that's like collectively pushing everybody in the same direction. So what but happens is there? Of any country? Do you think any country is like, I mean, to me, there's no homogenous, like everyone follows the same thing in the same brand. So I just, I don't think it's bad. I, I'll answer this a little bit. Number one, I don't think that it's like bad. Number two, I think every marketer has the opportunity to tell a story like on behalf of its country, you know, via whatever brand they're kind of in. Um, it doesn't have to just be driven by the tourism board. I mean, it is still tourism, but I thought really funny, you know, Auto Mexico was an example that I shared during my chat. Mm -hmm. And what I loved is each country has its own barriers as to why people don't want to go there. And you have to think about who the people you're trying to bring, where are they and what are the barriers for you to conquer? I loved that Auto Mexico example because they took this kind of 
racism tension and they made it a way to actually connect and bring people together. So I would say the more challenges and tensions and things that exist in your market, the more creative opportunities you actually have. Um, you know, you just got to, again, figure out how do you start telling some of your local stories in a way that, that you know, through the values that, that a global community might connect to. So the idea is don't wait for somebody to sit there and plan something at a larger scale. No, <laughs> that's definitely not. We've definitely learned this the hard way. Yeah, but you know, when you look at the US, you have to, you have to admit that on a large scale, people promote it quite similarly. I mean, up until, you know, shit hit the fan recently, whatever recently may mean for various people but there was a pretty a pretty consistent brand for the states like very mm -hmm. consistent no matter what country i went to it was always oh you you know like you 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 made it there or you you know that kind of feeling so there was something there's something to be said yeah. about about yeah. everybody to for better or worse regardless of what was actually happening inside the place, they were still sustaining, you know, the same, sure. the same statements. The export culture, we have Hollywood, we have Moot, right? And so I just think by nature of that, it spreads it a lot, but I think this is exactly what has caused the breaking point that we're almost at in. It's a promise well told, not necessarily always kept. And now that you're having that tension sort of inside, you're seeing this, come to light in many different ways and in many different facets of, of civil society and of government. Hmm. I'll stop talking, Guido, your turn. <laughs> no, I, I think that was beautiful. I mean, I, I, I always think of America like more on the level of like maybe values, like land of opportunity. You have uh, winners and losers. And if you work hard, you can become one of the winners. Um, so uh, they're communicating a little bit on that level. I think that's still a little bit the same, only it's become a little bit less inclusive. Before it was like, okay, you can have, you know, there is a possibility to become part of America because we are a country made of immigrants, right? And now yeah. it feels a little bit less like that. It's more like, okay, we've had enough now, you know, now who's in is in and now we're closing the door and, and the rest, you know, you do something else, uh, the American dream is no longer for you. Um, um, so that's that's and, there a little bit, right? And, and, and we're tarnishing other brands while doing it. Like I thought it was horrible. Oh, China and the, and we're tearing that. We're tearing another brand down. To make, I mean, it was yeah. It's it's not good. Hmm. And you're in your winners and losers, right? So <laughs> at least they're consistent. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, in your in your presentation, Miriam, you mentioned that in a in a McCann study, I think it was from 2018, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. uh, over 80% of people believe brands have a bigger potential to change the world than governments do. Do you think that's still true? And has that changed given what's happened? Recently? I mean, oh, loaded question. <laughs> you can we pass it. You can pass it to your, to your colleague if you want here. <laughs> I'm like, oh God, let me think about how I answer this politely. <laughs> Um, Rita, what do you think here? I'm sure you have a, a point. Well, of view. You know, I'd rather I, hear a foreign point of view before mine, I think. I kind of wondered how, you know, sometimes it's also about what questions you ask, right? Um, so I kind of wonder how that question was asked and what people were thinking at the moment when they said yes. Hmm. Uh, because when I'm thinking like, can do brands have more power than the government? Yeah, maybe they were thinking at that time of a Google and a Facebook when you know, now if Facebook went a little bit into a negative connotation sometimes, you know, with all, um, but still, still like, you know, things coming together, technology helping the world for the better. Um, right now, you know, you also see these companies becoming a little, having a little bit of a bad image, right? Like, hey, maybe Amazon is taking off all of these small uh, shops, uh, you know, and competing with the small shops, and is that really good? Do we really want that? So right now, I, I wonder if if you ask people right now that same question, if people say like, no, I think governments still have a um, um, a big role, and they put brands a little bit back towards the functional, right? Like a brand is there to give me a service, no longer to change the world. Hmm. And I think a year ago, also purpose was a really big, right? What we all talked about. And then, then there are two kinds of purpose. One is purpose is really like, okay, what is your purpose? 
also for you as a person, right? Like, what are you all doing it for? Your bigger why? But then, you know, and it was kind of like a hijacking of the words and changing it into social purpose. So like, besides making money, what are you doing good as well and, and trying to do for the world? Yeah. Right? And, and there was kind of like a, yeah, a, a not sincere purpose, so to say, but it was a very popular topic for a moment. But it also says something about the era and the time, right? Where companies should do a little bit more for uh, the world than just offering their products and services. And I think we're moving now again to a new era. I'm not a trend watcher, so don't ask me which era, but that's why we have Miriam. <laughs> Miriam, I'm setting you up here. <laughs> that is so elegant. <laughs> Waiting to coin the next era. <laughs> I mean, um, no, but it's in, like, all right, so I... So number one, I think sometimes within, especially the US, we let the government not function and then we throw that responsibility like on brands. And I think people are now recognizing throughout a COVID of like the role that a government actually mm -hmm. has to play in facilitating and organizing people through a crisis. And now we're sort of realizing, yeah, brands can be strong, but I also want my government to like function and work and be coordinated and communicate like some of those just like basic needs. That being said, I don't know if you guys remember at the beginning of the pandemic, you had tons of governments leaning into their companies to help them manufacture and produce um, so many of the goods that they need to, to sort of deal with this crisis. So you saw Louis Vuitton and some of those French companies switch to making um, sanitizing gel for like frontline workers. You know, within the US you had fashion companies and community like Christian Soriano was like the first winner of Rent the Runway, volunteered to make masks for like Governor Cuomo. Like, so you did start mm -hmm. to see this partnership start to come together. Like how do countries with production capabilities, you know, in the countries that they exist in start to assist and facilitate some of the gaps that the government maybe isn't able to like sort through. And I think people no doubt expect that level of partnership and in no way want to see partisanship in, in moments like that. Hmm. Okay. Do you, uh, speaking of, uh, speaking of examples, do you guys have any good examples of let's say some really great nation branding that you've seen happen maybe directly or indirectly this year? Um. Hmm. <laughs> Good branding or bad branding? Either, either way. I mean, you can learn from either one, right? The ones that did it well, the ones that didn't do it so well. Um, did anyone, I don't know that I saw any tourist company run a campaign this year. I think funds were quite limited in that, from that standpoint, but I don't know. Guido, do you have any good ones that maybe you saw? No, I was just thinking, still pondering a little bit about what you said before about companies and, and their role. And then mixing that with the question of Flavia about um, seeing any good campaigns. And I think companies without really putting forward necessarily, uh, you know, what the brand is all, um, kind of like the, the country of origin brand, right? Like with rum, it was really like Romanian chocolate. You don't always have to do that, right? Because if you, for example, think of Sweden, you know, then the brand ambassadors for Sweden could be considered IKEA or Volvo or Ericsson or Spotify, right? So companies itself by just their mere existence, and, and by being appealing to a certain group can also be a brand ambassador for the nation. Because have we seen many, um, now have I seen any nation branding activities from Sweden? I only remember one campaign where you could call a suite. Yeah. Uh, and you got a random number, you could call up a suite at any time and then, you know. Um, and, but that's about it, right? So I haven't seen any campaign ever, even for tourism for Sweden that I can remember. I but shared I it my presentation. Yeah, that was Clearly Brussels. I finished my presentation. I, the that was, the, the, I think the that was Brussels. Restaurant. Yeah. Not Sweden. Yeah. I think it was Belgium. Yeah. But I think Colin. Sweden has done a similar campaign. They did something actually. similar. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, yes. yeah, I think I agree with that. And that's what I would say. I guess I don't feel nation branding probably wasn't as overt this year as it maybe like has been in the past because of the travel industry. But like you started to see some forms of like kind of branding surface. So I think they said countries led by women tend to perform best throughout the 
pandemic than others. So now you've got, you know, uh, New Zealand and like Germany and some of these countries as, you know, countries that are run well, that function well. Maybe that message of inclusiveness that you're missing from the US, you're starting to see in places like New Zealand and so, sort of other countries. Um, I think, yeah, I, I would say that probably the companies that stepped up and to help and support during, you know, the the pandemic are sort of seen as like, again, ambassadors, like look at France stepping up to make sanitizer. Like even if all else fails in the US, we have Louis Vuitton <laughs> like sort of manufacturing for us. And so I think that, I think it was less direct, but I think we got told a lot of stories about how other countries like function and, and behave this year, just through the news and, and the way that events unfolded in general. Hmm. Yeah. I kind of liked how Africa was able to stay out of the news. So, <laughs> So I think that was like, I had seen three covers in Holland of newspapers that said, oh, Africa is next. Wait until this unfolds in Africa, you know, the whole COVID epidemic. And then, you know, somehow in Africa, they said like, it's not gonna happen here. They're like, no, thank you. <laughs> you know, well, well, nothing at least that we know of because it wasn't really in the news after that at all. And for example, I just uh, talked with somebody in Nigeria. They said like, yeah, it's not really here that much. And they thought themselves that they were so resistant to malaria that this COVID thing was almost nothing to them anymore. Maybe there's some truth in it. I'm not the doctor, but I thought it was interesting, right? That where this could have been very bad for, you know, the whole continent, no longer attracting maybe investment or tourists because this could have been a very, very bad pandemic health-wise, right? But, you know, first signs, looks at you know Kenya and Nigeria and South Africa has been relatively okay off or they're not but we haven't heard about it right mm. so that's, that's also the same thing from an outside in point of view because then we still want to go there mm. um, yeah so they've done something there right by you know maybe not communicating too much about it or just being okay as it seems to be the case at least in Nigeria but it's interesting because I say so I say nation branding and you guys automatically think campaigns, <laughs> you know? And so that's why when I was, that's, that's why when I was asking, you know, directly and indirectly, I was actually thinking about the New Zealand example, um, not necessarily because it was run by a woman, but because for me, New Zealand was put a little bit on the map for me compared to before, just because of indirectly right indirectly the brand as uh, of the nation for me was heavily affected by what i was reading and what i was discovering and and just the 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 i guess the the learning potential at a global scale that was coming from that country was really working its magic in many of the conversations that i was having and so and so that's uh, yeah in in my in my head and maybe <laughs> maybe i wasn't clear enough but in my head that's the kind of stuff that I found really incredible is that some places, you know, were without even noticing, were either doing well or not well by their brands. And and I think, and and to be honest, I don't even know how much the brand was really on their minds in times right. of crisis, because this is not the same as for a company and we can discuss whether that's good or not. But, um, but yeah, that's... No, that's... I didn't think about it like, but of course it's like, I just wrote like policy equals a campaign, right? <laughs> like that's like a political game is, is drafting policy. Yeah. To, I mean, we've all kind of danced around it a little bit. You're saying it right now. They, you held them in high regard because the policies that they put in place kept their citizens safe. Therefore they did a better job than other countries. The US this year put a policy in place to reject you know, visas um, from some of like the, you know, higher potential performing kids. And now we know earlier is like, it feels less inclusive to me, right? And so policy, you're very right, is without being so direct is very much like a campaign for the country. Hmm. I see uh, in the chat, I see um, somebody saying, if nation branding is influenced by reputation, then the COVID response should have, ha should have a huge impact on the image of nations. Uh, New Zealand is an excellent example of how COVID response has strengthened nation branding and for the U.S. how it's been tarnished. I would say yes and no there. 
Because on one hand, you see often when such a thing like COVID or, you know, there is a, a bomb going off like in Paris or in Boston, it is for a little while it's in the news and then everybody wonders like, does it stick? But it only sticks if it kind of like works uh, together with the, the image or, or the brand of the nation that's already there. So I think in New Zealand, it sticks because you kind of have this um, new style of leadership, right? This, uh, this power woman leadership. And maybe that's actually a trend, right? Because you see it now in New Zealand and I think there she set an amazing example. Mm -hmm. And we buy in and that aligns with her COVID response, right? So her COVID response is kind of like a proof point, right? The action point, the, 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 the doing part of, the, of her brand promise. Hmm. And maybe that's, that's also a sign of the times because we've seen in Finland, right? Where we have now a female prime minister and actually all of the political parties are headed by a woman, like all the five. Um, you see next, your next door neighbor, I think they just have a female prime minister, Flavia. Mm, yeah, yes. Which is, uh, yeah, a Harvard Kennedy School grad. Mm -hmm. So uh, kudos for her. And that was a, 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 also a big battle, right? But so you're seeing there a shift, right? So maybe, maybe after Donald Trump, right, you know, that very manly kind of like style of leadership, the world's also a little bit ready for like oh, a little bit of, uh, you know, balance and a little bit more of a, a feminine style of leadership. And maybe we're setting there also a new style of leadership because we see new leaders evolve a little bit, right? Each, each has yeah. their own different style there. I don't, and, and I don't know if it's, <laughs> I might disagree with on this because I don't know if there's like a woman style of leadership or men, you know, like I've seen men act like women and women act like men, like yeah. it's all blurred, right, for everyone. Um, but it almost, it almost reinforces, if I've, if I've ever worked with you, I probably, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is something I cite and talk about all the time. But I think, you know, no one gives a crap about what the tourism board's saying if at the very basic level, you can't keep your citizens safe, right? And so I think that bottom layer of safety came to the forefront this past year for all of us. And it put a new magnifying glass on governments and the way that they function and work with other people and shape policy uh, more than we've ever thought, you know, looked at that more than we ever have like in the past because, you know, everything's been good in the past. Yeah, a little, little nuclear thing here and there, but for the most part, right? People are traveling, they're out, they're living their lives, they're, you know, they're doing their thing. So it just, it re, I think because our priorities shifted, our needs changed, we've, re, we've changed the criteria and the way that we evaluate um, some of these brands that have been with us for a long time. Hmm. Yeah, I it's interesting what you say there. Uh, we often talk about expected and unique associations, right? Um, so the expected ones are, for example, safety, having good roads, et cetera. And those are kind of dormant because they're not in people's minds unless they're negative, right? So if you have potholes everywhere in the road, then you will remember it. Um, I always say like, if your car has four wheels, you don't see it. But if you take one wheel off, you, you'll see it and, and will remember it as well, right? You will feel it. Um, the same thing with COVID, right? If, if there's a disease, you will remember it. But the moment that is gone again, it's also gone and it's a non-issue anymore. So expected associations are only a problem if they're negative. So a country needs to get rid of the negatives. But mm -hmm. often countries focus only on the negatives, on getting like the framework right, like good roads, uh, hospitals, clean, safe. You definitely need that. But once you're there and the negatives are away, you're at the neutral zone, right? So then you need to also have something unique again. What are you about? And I see often that you know countries and governments, they focus only on what is expected. And they totally forget about thinking like, why should an investor choose me? And mm. I do, I work a lot in Africa uh, because in the past I worked for three years there. Um, and there you see a lot of folks is still on uh, the expected and it's needed, absolutely. But, but there are also, you know, more than 40 countries there, right? And, and that's just too much choice for an investor or a tourist, right? So if you're not one of the countries that's already loved by tourists, it's very hard to get in there and you have to do something to make yourself stand out and be unique. Otherwise, you're not getting the people in. And that's hard, right? You, you have to make choices again here. Hmm. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if, uh, I'm wondering when you can stop relying on the brand of a nation and you realize that you have to change it. And can you radically change it? Um, in a, I mean, 
let's say if you choose to do so, not because you're put in a <laughs> in a shitty position by others, but I'm just I'm just wondering I'm wondering how you you know how you identify the moment when you can no longer depend on that. <laughs> God loaded question. <laughs> um I mean, here, I think here's the thing though, for me that I, that I've realized this year, I guess over the last years, there, there haven't been, there hasn't in the past been much that I've depended on my government for, except what is expected roads, this, that, right? Never anything that is like unique. And when they collapse this year to me on just even delivering on the expected, um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess it, it's thrown me for for a loop. I guess, what do I say to this? Um, I just wanna be like, so then we voted that president out and that's how the story ends. But I don't, you know, like, I don't know if that's necessarily the right end to the story. I know that's not what you're getting at and that's not what I'm saying. I think all of us this year have realized too, maybe, you know, I sometimes talk about this in the US, like our best and brightest do not go into government. Um, they go into the private sector because the value of this country is like, make a dollar, get it, like hustle for yourself. And I'm over this last year, I've thought a lot about how like we really need people like best and brightest who are in government thinking about and solving problems. I looked at like even when the unemployment websites went up, um, half of them crashed because the infrastructure of the sites haven't been updated since 1993. How are we still talking about abortion, but we haven't upgraded our systems in a way to like 2020? So sometimes I think it's really funny here how I feel we, we can get pulled back into the same conversations that we in the US that we've been having for 20 years around low politics type things, where in reality, when we think about being competitive and staying on the world stage, there are much more like pressing issues. And I've realized that we can't even have the conversation because we have politicians that are just sitting in Washington, like fighting at you, fighting with each other. Like it's, it's pretty useless. But I mean, it's, it's okay. I, now I'm just sharing my political. <laughs> no, but it's, but it's, but it's okay. It's okay. To, I mean, your reaction to that is by saying, and we voted that president out says a lot because I think, I think to us, uh, okay. Maybe I shouldn't, maybe this is a good question. You know, to what extent can you set a parallel between an organization and a country then when it comes to branding? Because it feels like based on your reaction that the head of the country is way more relevant to the brand of the nation than maybe the head of an organization is to the brand of the organization. I don't know. I haven't seen necessarily somebody have such a visceral reaction saying that, you know, I'm not gonna buy from this company just because I don't like the guy that to that scale. I don't know. It has to be, I feel like it has to infiltrate way more throughout the entire brand and for you to feel it in multiple places before you can have such a strong aversion. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. This is just I'm just I'm I'm picking at the fact that you you know that was that was the natural response. I don't know, Guido, you have to, you're the one that you have to practical, you have to do the practical now. Well, you know, I, I think we, we are often, um, we're often looking a little bit about the moment, right? But, but brands, especially nation brands, they have been built over, over decades, right? Um, so it's very hard to, like you said, like just turn them around. It's really an oil tanker, right? So if you, turn an oil tanker around it goes per degree mm -hmm. and it might take you know half a day or something to make uh, well i've never sit i've never been a captain of an oil tanker but i could imagine that it will take a long time to turn around you know yeah maybe i've now somebody in the chat this goes like you know it's in seconds but anyway imagine that right and it's the same thing for a nation brand so um you know america is still america but maybe it has switched a few degrees where people kind of like have a little bit of doubt about the values they have be, they have said before, right? That inclusiveness and that that story and and anybody can make it, uh, you know. I, I have also a question there about that uh, from. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting what Frank Paul is saying in in the in the chat because you know it makes you think. Like if you see that the government is lagging, then do you as a as a brand sit there and say, no, I'm going to take on sustainable energy. I'm going to take on equitable distribution of wealth. I'm going to go, you know, similar to what Tesla did. Yes, it was part of what they wanted to do as a business, but the guy fought for the actual, you know, like systemic implementation of certain changes that needed to be made in order for his business model to function. 
he went head on. For some brands, it might not be so clear though. So then similar to another conversation that we were having on, on purpose, how do, you, how do you split the budget that you have as a marketer between doing something that's just for the greater good and doing something for the fact that you also have to help to sell the products or whatever the business model might be? I mean, you know, I love Frank Paul's question because it shows the value of what organizations can do. And we have some examples, but it's, I feel like the examples are so, they're too few. They're, yeah. you know, they're too few that have managed. And the question is, should there be more of them? And if so, yeah. how? Are, and are they too few or are they just not telling their story? <laughs> or that. It, because I'll give you a couple, but I know this because I read this and I care, right? Estonia incredible example of a country who's done you know thought uh, you know 30 40 years like ahead has an incredible digital economy like digital infrastructure right it's true they're positioning themselves as the next place of of the entrepreneur let's talk about china right the reason china has i mean yes privacy i totally other subject right but also they have they had no retail legacy and in that sense they could sort of leapfrog forward into a very digital first economy, everything sort of done like through the telephone. Um, and they're not trying to reconcile with a bunch of old like stores and retail buildings in the same way the US is. I think there are some great examples in Africa, um, Kenya and Ghana paving the way in solar, um, right? Because they don't have the infrastructure of a sort of his electronic grid. Therefore, they're jumping straight to these models. So I think there's plenty of opportunity for people to take and leapfrog ahead of the US. I actually, my fear right now is like we're totally falling behind. That's my point. Like we're sitting here fighting about low politic type issues. The whole world is passing us up at value and making money and staying competitive, you know, is important to our country. We're like losing sight of, of the North Star here. Um, hmm. So that, yeah, so that's my, I think there are great examples out there in the world. I just think they, they're not surfacing enough for me. Hmm. Another question in the chat where they ask a little bit like, okay, if I uh, work on, for example, systemic changes like transition to sustainable energy, more equitable distribution of wealth and opportunity, would those developments, much more than an approach to tourism, impact the value of nation brands? And I guess this is another example of expected associations, right? You kind of expect it to be a certain level of, of uh, facilities and if that's not there, then it's a problem. But if it's there, then it's neutral, right? However, it can be an expression of who you are, right? So America, like we talked before, is about land of opportunity. You can make it if you want it. You're either a winner or a loser. If you work hard, you're a winner, right? And the system also that they built around that based upon these values is supporting that. Um, Similar, if you look a little bit at business, where East Estonia did some branding, right? Estonia, but they're all about mm -hmm. you know online services, etc. Built upon uh, an authentic strength of them, right? So this is where you actually have kind of like the, the the country strength, and you see that in the brand as well. This isn't a tourism brand. This is kind of like almost a business brand. Um, so this is where you know the systems. And at the same time, uh, the brand go hand in hand. I wish it would be the other way around sometimes, you know, that you kind of go like, okay, I sometimes ask, you know, when I do sessions with governments, I say like, okay, um, what are you known for, right? And, or I've, I've done research from the outside in and asked like, what is your country known for? And then have a certain amount of associations. Uh, for example, with Paris, you could say like, okay, we're known for wine, we're known for cheeses, we're known for Paris. And say like, okay, Paris, that gives you tourists wine and cheeses that gives you export problem, uh, export problems, products, <laughs> it's Friday. Um, but then the interesting question is, what, what if you can add one more association, right? What if you can add one more association that helps your, helps your country with economic growth? Then mm. what do you want to be known for? Do you want to be known for like Estonia where they actually made a choice and said like, hey, we want to be known for online e-services, a digital country, very smart choice, right? Because high paying jobs, but they still made a choice. They didn't say like, oh, we're about that. And also about the business and that. No, often you can only drive one association, just like dating. You can only say one thing first. And then hopefully that is enough to tease somebody, you know, to learn more about you. And they Google you and they find out more about you and then they want to come. So yeah. this is a little bit how it, nation branding should interact with reality. Um, 
in real life, it's very, very few times that governments actually get it. And it's often small governments um, that do get it. Um, Dubai, great example. Um, uh, Rwanda with Pokagama, fantastic example. Estonia, a good example. So often it's more cities because, you know, it's easier to get things right there. But every now and then, you know, there are also organic values, right? That have grown like the US, they're, they're known for something and it's supported by movies and all of this stuff. Um, but it is a brand that's all already there. It's only not, you know, made a little bit, but sometimes they're still made. So it, it can be done. Hmm. That's a positive very positive note i like no, i like no, it i'm, I'm almost weekend <laughs> no i'm wondering i'm wondering because you mentioned earlier the importance about let's say the origins of brands and i uh, i have to ask if you think if you think that importance has has grown given given what has happened the importance of where a brand is is quote unquote made um and whether that's America first <laughs> you know country of origin right but i mean it's it's you know it's a valid argument everybody was constantly talking about you know buy local support your local this support your local that everybody started to look inwards and inwards and inwards and and i'm wondering what what you you guys have seen in terms of in terms of this shifting drastically um where you're from as well uh, I, I think this, this kind of like alludes a little bit to Frank Paul, where he says like, you know, let's look at the system as well. The system can also cause changes, right? So right now we in Europe maybe realize that we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't have made all of our medicines abroad in India and stuff, because the moment when there's a real pandemic, we might not get our medicines in, or they just simply uh, are not able to transport it. So we mm -hmm. kind of go like, oh, maybe we should have some local brands again and we should be a little bit more self-reliant. So this is where the system, you know, gives companies an opportunity to develop their own brands as well. Similarly, in Africa, there's now been a, an, a, a free trade region. Um, Africa trades for 80% almost only with, um, con uh, with, for example, Europe and other continents, but not within the continent. So not countries between countries. Now you have a free trade uh, area, then all of a sudden there's a big market again for also African brands. So you can start now an African brand and really, you know, distribute it amongst Africa, where before that was difficult. So this yeah. is where the system gives you an opportunity. So uh, in terms of trend watching, I'm predicting a lot of African brands starting to emerge in the next decade. And if I would put my money on something, uh, then I would put my money there in terms of branding, because we've seen from for example, Interbrands Best Global Brands, that, you know, strong brands, they give you way much more of a return as well. That's what makes our job so much fun, right? We kind of help brands grow. And if possible, we, we give them some purpose as well so they do something good for society. Hmm. Mariam, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I <laughs> She's think- She's like, I'm collecting them. <laughs> give me a moment. <laughs> I mean, I think, I just think it's different, I guess, in the U.S. for me, because this has been happening to me over the last like 10 years where we're getting much more aware of where things come from, not necessarily out of like a country origin point of view, but just like, where is my food coming from? Where is my stuff being made? How natural is it? How is it not? So the U.S. has really sort of paved the way with that, I think, over the last 10 years. And I think it was just something that was like really reinforced during like the pandemic but i'd argue that that understanding or awareness of where things are made you know understanding the supply chain a little bit more of the companies we buy for has been something that some americans have probably paid attention to for for like the last 10 years um, and i think you see that just in like some of the d to c brands that are sparking up or companies that are starting saying your stuff is all unnatural and made everywhere like this is made here so i think there's a little bit of that battle right now kind of taking place too Hmm. Okay. I mean, uh, to be to be completely honest, I I talked a lot about the the things that I that I that I wanted to hear from you guys. I obviously know you, a, you know, maybe a little bit better than the people on the line. But I don't know if you have any final thoughts, anything you'd like to say. This is a pretty personal topic compared to maybe some of the other ones that yeah maybe compared to some of the other lives. So I do want to give you guys a chance to say something if you want to um, before we go as any final thoughts on, on nation branding and 
and I guess where it's heading, to be completely honest. Depending on where it's heading. <laughs> Go, on, Miriam. Where are you first a second? I don't know if I have like a crystallized thought. Um, it on doesn't how to have to be. I think, I think um, I mean, I'll speak from the US point of view. Like I always sort of talk about how America is such a young democracy, right? It's only really been around for like 250 years. Um, whereas Europe and other parts of the world have gone through world wars and plagues and things like we've, you know, we, we're just starting to go through some of that maturation process in terms of who we are and trying to make sure that our, our promise can live up to sort of like what is delivered. I think we're very much at an inflection point. And I think the next 10 years for America will really be interesting because who does it want to be again on the world stage and does it want to be this kind of world power that it that it sold to the world back in the day or is it having its own version of like a Britney Spears type meltdown on the world stage right now and you know we'll never know what you know we'll never recover in the same way I don't know but I think that is sometimes when people get so angry at America I'm like you guys have to remember like we're not we haven't done all the cycles sometimes that some of the other countries have and I, and I think there's something to where Europe and some European countries have ended up um, versus maybe like where we are now. Hmm. My last. That's a good point. That history plays a pretty significant role and maybe isn't brought to the forefront very often. To be honest, in in you know nation branding, maybe sometimes is always uh, uh, tried to be done uh, a little bit uh, like you know looking for the sexy things that you want to attract people with. You know, but I don't. It's it's. I think it's much rarer when you find when you find them built on on very historical, you know, or taking history so much in into consideration. But for the US, I guess it's a it's a valid point that people need to contextualize things a bit. I don't know. Yeah. You know? Maybe uh maybe uh, US is ready for second date, right? We know what it stands for and now they're still freaking out a little bit the deeper levels. Um, I'm more interested actually in in the, the countries that from the outside in, so the external perspective haven't really figured out what they are all about. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, for example, I, I just did a session uh, in Africa where we asked like, okay, think in Africa of a place where you want to retire. Think in Africa of a place where you would go shopping. You know, when you asked it in Nigeria, they go like, oh, Dubai, you know? And I kind of go like, well, isn't it strange that often people have gone more often to Dubai than to uh, another country in on the continent, right? So there is an opportunity there. So what if you become the first city or country that is known for shopping in Africa? What if you become the first country, you know, which has a great health system where this is the place where you want to retire? Hmm. What if you become the country where it's perfect, you know, to start that uh, online business? Well, that's at least what they were trying to do a little bit in Kenya and Rwanda, for example. But there are opportunities still there that if you get a position in the mind, then, um, then you, know, you can take advantage of that. For example, if, if we look at Europe, if you wanna start a fashion empire, where would you start it? You already have probably three destinations in mind, right? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. What are the three destinations? London, oh, Paris, Milan. London, Paris, Milan, right? Now you're starting a fashion empire in Africa. Which country do you go to or which city? Right? I have no idea. But there's an opportunity there, right? For example, Ghana, there's a lot of things with fashion. Why not brand yourself as that a little bit more and attract that kind of companies as well? Um, so there yeah, it's true. There is like a, there's like a hint. It's like, you have a hint. You would say, you know, like Morocco comes to mind because you know some of the fat, but that's just because of how the fashion has traveled, you know, has traveled, uh, has yeah. traveled West to a certain extent and influenced some of the, some of the trends in recent years, but you're right. There isn't, you know, there isn't, there isn't a clear. Yeah, I'm just thinking so the out loud. learning point and maybe the last point then uh, that I like to make normally is it's not about the logo, uh, even though it can play an importance. It's not about your your campaign, even though you need a campaign to tell your story. Mm -hmm. but it's often about finding about finding out who you are, and com and then start communicating that lot through what you say and what you do. And I think a lot of countries haven't found out who they are yet or what to put forward on their first date with people, investors, tourists, whatever. 
And if they know that, then I hope that people don't see branding as a communication thing, but they see it as, wow, this is actually a strategy. And that's why I call it brand strategy. It's a strategy to use your brand, your image, to get people in for whatever reason you want. Hmm. And if, if, you know, people, and that's why I, I teach at the London School of Economics and Political Science, that's very purposefully chosen for nation branding, right? Because those are the kind of people that I want to talk to mostly uh, because those are people that not only go to companies that become brand ambassadors for your country, but also people that go into the politics, for example, or the economics of countries and see it, how they can use it to kind of like help the country go forward and stand out a little bit more. That's super neat. I like, I like how you drew, how you drew that, that together with, with London School of Economics. Super, you guys, I think we could stay here much longer <laughs> debating some of these topics. We know, we know that about each other well, but um, I have to say thank you really for, for joining us. I really appreciate it, taking the time. And for everybody that's watching, um, you know, uh, like I've said, I think maybe a hundred times before, I'm, we're very humbled <laughs> by the response that we've gotten for, for our, our open branding month. So I really, really appreciate it. Um, I really do. And I, and I speak for the whole team. So thank you. I know it's Friday and, but you still have two masterclasses this weekend and then we'll be back with the lives on Monday. So definitely check the website rebelsrulers.com and you know, see which ones you like, which ones you want to join, what topics are of interest. And until then, I guess I say bye to you guys. I thank you again. And I wish bye, everyone bye. a really yeah. great weekend. Bye. <laughs> bye. Have a good one. Bye.